here we are. We're live. Welcome, welcome, welcome to everybody. Bienvenue à tous. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the original unceded homeland of the Wolastukwi Maliseet people. Wolastukwi is covered by the treaties of the peace and friendship, which Wolastukwi Grand Chief Charles Mani Duhik first signed with the British Crown in 1728. The treaties did not deal with any surrender of lands and resources, but in fact recognized Wolastukwi title and established the rules for what was going to be an ongoing nation to nation relationship. So just so we have that acknowledgement. Uh, good evening. My name is Maggie Connell. I'll be your moderator for tonight. This is my first experience moderating on Zoom, so we'll see how that goes, but I'm looking forward. All right, um, as part of a healthy democratic process, uh, that includes hearing from as many groups and individuals as is possible to that end. This, this initiative is supported by the following groups, and I'll read those out to you. The Anglican Diocese, Black Lives Matter, Christ Central Church, Conservation Council of New Brunswick, Council of Canadians Fredericton Chapter, Fierte Fredericton Pride, Fredericton Anti-Poverty Association, Fredericton Heritage Society, Imprint Youth Association for LGBTQIA plus youth and young adults, Solidarity, Fredericton Solidarity, Trees Matter, Fredericton, and Wilmot United Church. Each of those groups has submitted one question for consideration by each of our four candidates. Answers given by the candidates will help members of the audience make informed choices on election day. Please note that we also need to leave time to hear questions from the audience. Consequently, we may not be able to cover all group questions, but we'll do our best. Les réponses données par les candidats aideront les membres de l'auditoire à faire des choix éclairés le jour du scrutin. Merci d'avoir participé à ce processus démocratique. Votre présence fait la différence, vraiment. All right, so I will introduce the candidates uh, to you and uh, we'll go from there. Uh, so uh, the first one that I see anyway is Mayor Mike O'Brien. Mike, just raise your hand so we know that's you. Uh, next is Kate Rogers. Drew Brown is next. And Corinne Hersey's at the end there. All right, so I'm just gonna, for the candidates, I'd just like to go over a few rules of engagement so, so that we can make this as seamless as possible. Each of you will be given one minute to introduce yourself. If you don't need that much, no problem. A question from the list will be asked by me, and each of you will have one to two minutes to respond specifically to that question in a clear and concise manner. Remember, that's what your audience has come to hear. Please don't feel you have to fill that two minutes. If you've said what you need to say in a minute, that's fine. Just let me know and I'll move to the next candidate. In fact, I, I'm, it would be best if you could try to stay closer to one minute than two on these questions so that we can cover as many as possible. At a minute and a half, you're going to see a yellow card appear in front of the timekeeper. You'll see it there. Uh, at the bottom right of the screen, indicating you have 30 seconds to wrap up. At two minutes, a red card appears indicating your time is up. Please respect this timing candidates. I'll be moving to the next candidate quite quickly as we have several questions to cover and I really don't want to interrupt you mid-sentence. I'll rotate the order of responses so when a question is asked, we will, each time a question is asked, we will start with a different candidate so that everybody has a chance to be a first responder. A first responder, okay, we can say that. Um, and uh, so at this point, do we have any questions? Any questions? No, we can move on then. All right, for the audience, your rules of engagement, if you have a question for the candidates, please click, click on the Q&A uh, icon at the bottom of your screen to type it in. 
It will then appear on the screen and be visible to all. When you hit that Q&A, you should be able to see that list of questions. As these, are questions, as these questions appear in the list, you may see one or two that you particularly like, and there'll be a little thumbs up icon there. If you click that, we'll be able to keep a tally of which questions are uh, most popular and those questions will rise to the top of the list and be asked first. Uh, so the question with the most with the most votes will get uh, first attention. Okay. All right, candidates, we're ready to go. So roll up your sleeves. Hello Z. <laughs> tell us about yourself, please. You have one minute to tell us who you are. Tell us something about yourself. Let's start with Mayor Mike O'Brien. Oh. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Mike, and I've uh, had the honor to be your mayor for the last five years. I uh, wear the love, my love of Fredericton on my sleeve. Talk about rolling up the sleeves. I was raised here, made my career here, and uh, Anne and I have raised our four daughters here. Um, I, I relish in community uh, involvement. Uh, I served 15 years as the counselor for Fred, uh, Nashwalk SIS in North Devon, and the last five as mayor that my engineering from UNB career was mostly in the private sector and at executive levels. And I was really uh, proud to be able to bring that uh, skill and expertise to my uh, mayor's job. When I see a problem, I try to fix it. When I see an opportunity, I try to grab it. So under my leadership, we have uh, raised, uh, we've been able to keep the lowest municipal tax rate in New Brunswick, the lowest water and sewer rates. We found millions in operational efficiencies. We've been recognized as a national leader in climate change, protecting our environment. And we've grown as a culturally rich city, and I'm really proud of those accomplishments. That's probably about a minute, so I'll stop there. Let's go to Kate at this point. Hi, thanks, Vega, and good evening, everyone. Hello, so I'm Kate Rogers. I have been on council for nine years. I served as deputy mayor for two years. I'm delighted to be with everyone tonight, and. Um, a little bit about myself. I have a background in political science. I have a master's in political science, and uh, but I've spent most of my career working in the community sector as executive director of a few organizations, um, some arts organizations, New Brunswick Crafts Council, Charlotte Street Arts Center. I was the managing director of the Social Policy Research Network, which was a, 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 a collaboration between the province and the public universities in the province. And um, most recently, I was the executive director of the Fredericton Community Foundation, where I worked worked with lots of wonderful community groups, some of which are hosting this event tonight. And for that, I'd like to thank you. Um, so I'm, I've, I, I love this city too. And uh, everywhere I look, I just see more opportunities. I'm proud of what's been accomplished during my time on council, but I just see that there is more that we can do. And to do it, I feel that we need to take a different approach. And I'm running really on, on a platform that our growth um, be matched by our ability to house your, people. Your time care. is up. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much, you. Kate. Corinne, yeah. your turn. Hi, I'm Corinne Hersey and uh, Marysville girl. Grew up in Marysville all my life and have lived here most of my life, except for a stint in Stockholm and in China, um, where I was researching and studying. But um, I guess. I think what I'd have to say about myself is that uh, as an educator, I've just been really happy to have students be as involved in the organizations and committees and agencies as what I have been. Um, this past semester, I had 54 presentations of students working with the shelters and um, AIDS New Brunswick and, oh, um, all, all around Canada because that's where students were. So I think it's great that I have the ability to work with so many other people and inspire, hopefully inspire those people as they've inspired others. I think that's what I can bring to the table. Thank you. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, Drew, it's your turn. Hello, uh, my name is Drew Brown. Uh, I've lived here in New Brunswick for 20, almost 28 years. Um, I'm running as a mayor. I'm um, interested in, uh, my little slogan is, uh, I want to run for housing, homelessness and heritage. I'm a mayor who believes in action. I um, have been troubled by the recent problems the city has been suffering through for our housing and homelessness. And uh, I believe that there could be more active 
participation from the city in helping solve some of these problems. I'm running for municipal, uh, municipal office because I believe that the political situation is in New Brunswick, um, that we have the best chance of making change at the municipal level at this time. Thank you, Drew. Thank you very much. Okay, so that's the four, these are your four candidates who will be answering these questions in rotation. The very first question goes to Mike O'Brien. Um, we often hear from our current city council that many issues or decisions are outside the purview of the municipality, that those responsibilities fall to the province or the federal government. However, we also see a rising role in uh, rise in the role of the municipality, for example, City of Moncton putting forward several million dollars towards an affordable housing project, or City of Fredericton agreeing to put forward funding for the city motel project. So here's the question. If elected, how would you navigate intergovernmental jurisdiction and what role do you see for the municipal government on addressing projects and problems facing our communities, such as homelessness, poverty, racism, and climate change? Mayor O'Brien, it's up to you. Um, yeah, th those are complex uh, issues. And um, I, I guess I, I'll premise this, the fact that things are changing. The society's changing, the roles of governments are changing. Uh, 10 years ago, the roles were crystal clear. Um, and it was very easy to stay in your lane because you knew exactly what it was. But nowadays with uh, funding being the way it is and uh, everybody, you can't expect the provincial government to do exactly what they always did or the federal or the municipal. And the expectations of our citizens have changed and that's good. They demand that there's quicker action and they, the lines blur between the three levels. Uh, I've spent my career working with all levels of government and partners and trying to negotiate and work through things and been quite successful in quite a bit of it. But the recent societal society things um, with homelessness, mental health addictions, they are complex and the municipalities certainly cannot do it. Uh, they can't do it by themselves. And sometimes the provincial government can't. They rely on the federal government. So the way that, that, that we have to interact, you did, you, you're right. Moncton has a severe crisis on their street. So do we. Theirs is four or five times larger. They had to take some serious quick action. We were eventually be able to navigate and get it behind the city motel project, something that we've never done to that level before. So I think that that indicates that we are ready to have an open mind to, uh, to step into these things. We have to work with our partners even closer because um, we're a creature of the province and they can always download on us. And sometimes it's hard to push back up, but we're learning how to do that better. And it's gonna take uh, continual cooperation and different ways of thinking to do so. Um, we have to be protective of our tax rate because if we step outside too far, we'll end up spending money on things that we don't, that we're supposed to really do uh, traditionally. So we're learning how to do this. We're learning new ways to do it. We're adapting as we go. I think you'll see some bold actions in the, in the, in the ensuing years um, because we have to, but we'll be careful how we do it too. We have to be very careful as we step forward. So thanks for that question. Okay, thank you very much, Drew. Hello, I'm just unmuting myself. I'm, I'm of an opinion that the city has a lot that it can do. Um, as far as I can understand, it can own property. And if the city can own property, I would believe that would allow it to have some direct impact upon the housing market as it presently exists. I recognize that there are some limitations by the present municipal legislation, but I propose that the city look at, if elected as mayor, we would look at any option for the housing. If we had to own property or buy an existing property, I would certainly think that would be what we can do. I believe the city has to do what it can do. The other level of governments, we can't spend or waste any more time waiting for them to come aboard and help us on some of these very desperately needed projects. That's very good, thank you. Kate, your turn. 
Thank you. Yes. Um, well, one of the reasons I ran for council, for a municipal council, is because I municipal government is the government that's closest to the people, and it's the one that knows its residents the best. And for that reason, I think it's often it's the most natural convener to bring people together. And obviously, um, you know, jurisdiction is 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 factual. I mean, we have were that we have been legislated certain responsibilities, but. I find that we too often cite jurisdiction as a reason for the city to not do something, as opposed to seeking out ways that we can collaborate and work together. Because I think sometimes the jurisdiction needs to be flexed. Uh, currently, it particularly needs to be flexed because we're in a time of crisis, particularly in housing. And we have used jurisdiction as a reason to not be more engaged. And I, I think that, that, that we are using it as an excuse in this as opposed to finding a way to make it to make it work better. Fredericton needs to provide the right kind of leadership so that other partners come to the table and work openly and work collaboratively through open communication and pursuit of common goals. And this is something I believe that has been lacking. And I think that we can do better. Municipalities are, are, are best placed to do this work for bringing people together, for having this intergovernmental relationships for fostering those relationships. And, and I see that as a real opportunity for us to show leadership as a municipal government to, to, to do that. It doesn't mean that we need to cross over and necessarily even pay for things or ask our, we are the stewards of, of the Fredericton taxpayer dollar. And I'm not suggesting it means that we always have to, to step into the lane and pay, but, it, but we can be more actively engaged in the role. Thank you. All right, next is uh, Corinne, Corinne Hersey. Sorry, I think that as far as working with other agencies and government levels, that's something that needs to be done on an ongoing, um, all the time. It's not just when there's a crisis. And we have to be more proactive than reactive. And so not waiting for a crisis to happen and not going across the, the table to meet other agencies, but they should always have a seat at the table they should be part of what we do. Um, I don't believe we're a creature of the province. Yes, the province has their thing, the federal government has their thing, we all have different legislations, but we're, we are a creature of the people. It's the people who put us into power and, and it's them that we have to represent. So um, you work with the government leaders who are in um, and you go work with government leaders who are opposition and work across the floor and you use other municipalities to build a coalition with so that is how you get things to happen in the province and how you get other levels of government especially provincial to be more engaged um, so that they can't just ignore one municipality they're basically ignoring all and um, so yeah I think that uh, you know, we stop a crisis before it happens, we are proactive, and then we make sure that we are engaged as much as possible, and that we go to them more than waiting for them to go to come to us. Okay, thank you, Corinne. Um, we'll go to the we'll go to the second question now, and we're going to begin with Kate this time. Uh, la deuxième question. 57% of our Fredericton's carbon pollution comes from heating and cooling buildings. The majority of these greenhouse gases are from coal-fired electricity consumption, about 81%, with the remaining coming from the consumption of natural gas and fuel oil. Question, what is your plan to retrofit every building, including private homes, to increase energy efficiency, reduce people's and business owners' power bills, and create jobs for thousands of tradespeople. And Kate, you're on. Oh, sorry, just unmuting. Thank you for that question. So, so climate action is uh, something that we are increasingly. Uh, pointing attention to, uh, paying attention to at, at a city level. And uh, we, we've done some great work actually at, a, at the city level uh, in very recent years with our climate action plan. We're looking at uh, the community through energy and emissions and um, both at a corporate level and, and at a community level. So I would say that some of the efforts have are just beginning and 
and I, so one thing that I would do is continue on with those efforts. And we have put it, there's a plan in place with priorities. I think it's really um, identifying which priorities, where we start, where we get moving first. But I feel that the instructional manual is there, manual is there and now it's really, it's our place to take that on. Um, for me, a lot of the opportunity lies in just taking a very, an overall view. So often we have put sort of climate change action more in, in engineering or we have siloed it. And I think that the best perspective to take is to incorporate it um, and for it to be integrated in all aspects of city governance. And, and so that would include, yes, engineering, but, but it would also include when we're working in development or we're working in our planning department and they're working with developers, it includes our own building services. It, um, as we're working through with our business organizations, um, encouraging you know businesses to to be uh, to be developing lines of business in in those areas. So, for me, a lot of it as a leader is just to have it as a priority to the, the plans that we've put in place to make sure that they are implemented, to put um, muscle and weight behind them um, and give them the support that are, that's required. And also just to be innovative and forward thinking and to have a bias to yes, as opposed to creating reasons and barriers for why things can't happen and why we can't move forward in climate change. Um, for me, the proactive and prepared in flood mitigation is critical, but there's so much more that we can do for adaptation. Thank you, Kate. Um, let's move on now to Corinne. Um, I think as far as uh, bringing green to the city, uh, first we create as many carbon sinks as possible. If we're just looking for action plans, we make sure that we have more green spaces, more trees. We don't build buildings along riverbanks, we plant trees along riverbanks. We make sure that there are more gardens and there, uh, if there's asphalt somewhere that is not needed and there has to be development go up, then you put the development on the asphalt, not on the green. Um, that we make sure that we incentivize green businesses to come into Fredericton. And when, we're rich, when we look at heritage housing, then yes, that heritage housing has to be retrofitted. If we can work with the government to bring CDFs into the province where people can invest in small businesses, then that helps with the, the, the ways in which the economy gets stimulated so that we actually know the money that we're working with. And we look at those projects that are not necessarily projects that um, make a better quality of living for people in Fredericton, but that for everybody in Fredericton, we make sure that we look at the ways in which our money is getting spent and we prioritize and make sure that we, our action plan is not just words, but that we have actual plans, plant trees, create gardens, <laughs> take out asphalt, make the city center of the city less car friendly, um, use heritage buildings as housing and those sorts of things. So I see really one, two, three, four, five, six, like actually actual things you can put into place. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, let's go to Drew. Same question, Drew. Well, it's a great question. And I have to agree with Corinne. I think there's lots of, things we can do from a carbon sink perspective. I have a background in forestry and uh, as a younger man, I did a lot of tree planting. And as a mayoral candidate, I have part of my platform that I personally will lead a crew of tree planters from basically June to September until the students go back to try and green up the downtown, increase the number of trees being planted, I would like to see, um, likewise, as Corbin was sending, there's some spots where I think we have a lot of asphalt that perhaps we could use some different material to help with our, our, our amount of uh, heat that's being trapped inside of the, uh, the envelope of the city. And uh, as far as practical things going, I mean, we do, the city does own a lot of buildings. Um, as some people are aware in Fredericton, Fredericton High School had a number of solar panels installed on the roof. So it would be interesting to go talk to them and see uh, what sort of success they've had in reducing their, their heating costs. I don't know if the electricity generated helps with the cooling costs, but knowing high schools, I don't remember them ever having air conditioning. So I'll just go on the fact that it's probably helping with the heating costs. But that is something that that is there, an example has been made, someone has already taken action on that. And I think that's something 
we could learn from and then replicate. I, uh, you know, that means we have some local expertise in doing that. And of course, since we would have a second iteration at it, uh, we could do it better, perhaps, or at least as well. And um, I'd also like to see if we could encourage um, some of our developers and builders to maybe take more of those um, environmentally friendly steps with their building. I'm sorry, Drew, your time is up. Thank you very much for your response. Over to you, Mike. Thank you. Uh, Corinne, you described our 25 year growth strategy. A lot of those initiatives that you've uh, identified are things that we're really already putting into our plan and working hard on it. We plant 500 trees a year on average and we're, our goal is to really increase that, increase our tree canopy. I think the question was about buildings and efficiencies. And uh, uh, myself about six years ago introduced the smart energy plan uh, to the city and we, it's now morphed into what we do now for energy planning. And um, so we've driven our own energy costs way down and we allow our staff for everything that we save in energy to reinvest in more, more efficiency programs. Uh, on Monday night, we just got a presentation on the new community energy uh, emissions plan that's being introduced into the community to drive our baseline or uh, our greenhouse gas reductions in the entire community down to 80% uh, over baseline by 2050. So that's going to be a really aggressive and hopefully we can get the province to adopt the new national building code, which will drive efficiencies into uh, into the new builds. Uh, also, I just uh, uh, promoted today uh, to try to see if we can get the uh, adopt of uh, the solar city program that Halifax has. Provincial legislation right now does not allow municipal cities to, in to incent homeowners to do solar heating. But if we could get that adopted, uh, that's a place where the city could then finance people to do their uh, solar heating upgrades. They could pay us back through a tax uh, levy and over 10 years. And that could really do a magnificent job in driving down our overall emissions, as creating a green economy and helping us create this wonderful community even make, make it even better. So there's lots of things, national building code into new builds, letting the municipalities uh, incent some people to do solar heating upgrades and continue, as you say, with all our uh, tree plantings and, uh, and all the, the benefits they bring to our community. Thank you, Mike. All right. Um, I think uh, I want to ask at this point, can each of the candidates see the yellow and red card? So just nod if you're good with that. You see it on your screen? Okay, I just want to make sure. All right. Uh, now, la deuxième question. Oh, non, c'est la troisième question maintenant. Economists, banks, businesses, scientists, and even the US military have been warning us that climate change in the near future will pose the greatest threat to our safety, security, and economic well being. All levels of government and citizens need to view our activities and development through a climate lens to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions and plan for future predicted climate events. Would you support working with a climate change advisory citizens council as we move forward in dealing with the climate crisis? And we begin this round with Corinne Hersey. 100%, that's all I have to say. It's simple as that, as the Green New Deal, we have to adapt it. Um, anyone who knows me knows that's where my heart lies. There's that's what I teach. That's, that's where I am. So in 10 seconds, 100%, I'd work with NB Nature Trust. I'd work with any organization that comes in and uh, wants to promote a clean city and a clean planet. We can't be healthier than the planet, period. That's it. Thank you, Corinne. Um, and over to Drew at this point, please. Okay, I believe I've unmuted myself. Uh, I think if there's going to be a committee of citizens that are trying to advise on climate change with the city, I think it would be worthwhile. Uh, as long as there's action involved with it, I think it would be very worthwhile. I, I as a mayor, want to see action. Basically, I would like that type of arrangement. However, I would want to action to come out of that arrangement. So if we're meeting with groups, and there are citizen groups and they have an action plan, like for example, uh, 
the Nashwalk River has a has a group that plants trees along the riverbank. If they came to the city saying we need funding for more of our activities, as long as there was an action to go along with that, I would be all for it. Um, I think talk is very productive, but there has to be a point where you take action. And I think that point is, as most experts will realize, we might be past that point, but we have to take action and do what we can. Okay, thank you, Drew. Uh, over to you, Mike. Oh, thank you. Hey, Drew, we've we've helped that Nashwalk uh, watershed group with their uh, with their plantings down on the uh, the Marysville Flats. Uh, so that's been a great partnership. Um, I, I mentioned just a bit earlier that we launched our community energy emissions plan, and uh, well, we've launched it, it'll be launched publicly very soon. But we announced what it was going to be. That's going to be a robust engagement with the public. And we don't know exactly what form that's going to take yet, other than there's going to be continual, it, there's going to be opportunities for residents, businesses, institutions, levels of government to all participate. And out of that will come committees, dialogue, whatever it is. And uh, we will be forcing though, that to make sure that is a, that one of the uh, robust engagement processes that we've ever had, because it's too important not to do it. So actions will come out of that. Uh, we work very closely right now with the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and the Global Covenant of Mayors. Uh, to work on climate adaptation. Matter of fact, we're, we're recognized as a leader, our staff people to go to that, lead the processes because of the expertise and the actions and the plans that we have in place. So I'm proud of the work we do on it, but it is the, um, it, it's, uh, it, 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 it's not time for talk on that. It's time for, uh, you know, actions to come out of the talk. So I agree 100%, uh, willing to uh, participate, uh, take action. Uh, it's too important not to. And, uh, and we are, and uh, I'm committed to make sure that we continue. Thank you. All right, Kate. Sorry, okay, I was having, I'm really struggling the same way that Drew was with unmuting myself. So I um, have the pleasure of, I chair two advisory committees with the city. One is the Arts and Culture Advisory Committee, the other is the Affordable Housing Committee. Those committees are multi-stakeholder committees and they consist of members in the community who bring expertise, professionalism and informed knowledge to bear on the, on the topics. I would say that um, we, we couldn't pay for the wealth of knowledge that we have sitting around around those committees. And I would, I would imagine us doing something very similar with climate change. When I look at the two univer the universities, the community colleges, the, the nonprofit organizations that are based in Fredericton, it would be foolish of us to not draw on that knowledge and that expertise to guide us. Currently, we only have one uh, one, there's only one staff position des dedicated to, to looking at climate change. Certainly it overlaps into other areas within the city, but there's only really one point person. So I think there would be a huge benefit to draw on the knowledge that's in community. It's, And I think it's something Thing that I know to work through my work at the Social Policy Research Network, through my work in the community. I just know the, um, the knowledge, the passion that exists, the know-how. Um, typically, nonprofit groups are roll up your sleeves, get stuff done. They don't have time to wait around um, because they're the ones that are doing things to make movement in, in, in our city. So I would say, why not reach out to them, bring them to the table, draw on that expertise and draw on that on that energy to, to continue to move this, this file forward because it's too big to not include everyone. Thank you, Kate. La quatrième question, on va commencer avec Drew. How will you improve the relationship with the Willis-Cookoui by honoring and implementing the Truth and Reconciliation's call to action and honoring and thereby upholding the 1725 26 Peace and Friendship Treaties. Drew, you're first. Well, I've always been very sympathetic to Native issues. I worked as a summer student way back in the day for the Department of Indian and Northern Affairs, and I actually worked in the specific claims branch. Um, and Interestingly enough, New Brunswick is one of the, well, New Brunswick is one of the few places where Aboriginal title was never extinguished. And what that basically means is the government of the day didn't say, okay, to the various First Nations, we want to own this land and we're going to extinguish your right to it. 
Now, uh, if you go across the rest of Canada, this only occurs again in BC. Most of the other treaties, that was the primary reason for the treaty. So it's interesting that this uncertainty exists. I think it, we have to be respectful uh, with the people who are uh, of, of that indigenous group. Um, they certainly have the right to say, well, why haven't you guys come to the table and hammered out an agreement? Because there has been over 200, almost two, oh my goodness, almost 200 years since that original treaty was signed. Uh, and, and, you know, thank goodness for the indigenous people being friendly enough to sign a peace and friendship treaty. Who knows what would have happened to us if our neighbors to the south and west had decided, well, perhaps, perhaps we should have that piece of territory as ours. So we are very, we've benefited from this relationship. I think it's time, when I say we, I mean we as the colonial people here have benefited from it. And I think we have to figure a way out forward where it benefits them as well. Thank you very much, Drew. All right, la cinquième question, commençant avec Michael Bryan, cette fois-ci. The Fredericton Anti-Poverty Organization was established 38 years ago. In the last year alone, in the midst of a pandemic, FAPO distributed $270,000 worth of food, clothing, and housewares for free to people in need at no cost to government, taxpayers, donors, or recipients. It's been at least 10 years since the late David Kelly's time, since a, uh, since a city councillor has even paid a visit to our organization. Here's the question. With that level of interest in the work of our organization and others, can you tell me why poor people should even bother voting in this election. Why not just send out the ballots to the developers and let the rest of us go home? Interesting okay. question. Mike, you uh, first. Uh, just before I start, uh, there was only the one response to the uh, to the peace and friendship. Oh, did I, did I miss a beat on that? <laughs> well, uh, I didn't know if that was intentional or not. No, but, uh, not at all, not at all. You're, okay. Your turn now, Mike. Okay, thank you. Uh, Look, uh, for uh, 15 years as a councillor, uh, the, um, I represented the, uh, the, the area that St. Mary's First Nation was in. I certainly did not represent them. They are, they are self-representative. So, but I had a, a great opportunity to partner and learn from them for 15 years uh, from uh, the Indigenous people at St. Mary's. Um, uh, so I have a deep respect, uh, and, uh, but I don't have a deep understanding. I can never, I can never learn enough. Uh, the city of Fredericton, in uh, the last few years, we got bogged down a bit too much with um, transactional issues with St. Mary's, working on development and land trades and, and water and sewer agreements. Uh, and that seemed to occupy uh, a lot of our time. But we finally have um, been able to step back. We've created a new position at the city that is our uh, indigenous relations uh, uh, individual. And uh, we're really trying to uh, foster a uh, a deeper understanding and respect for the relationship that must be there. Um, the new council that's coming uh, will be coming in is going to be giving the, uh, the the cultural training that's required to, to at least get a basic understanding of the way forward, such as the blanket exercises and that to uh, to get a, a deeper respect. Um, we are going to uh, develop right now everything that we do from uh, major projects. We we obviously have to and must and and are willing. Uh, uh, are honored to participate with the Willistiqui peoples on uh, discussions on our new projects going forward. So it's that new relationship. Uh, we have to learn how to do it. It's our responsibility to do it. It's not the Indigenous uh, people's responsibility. It's ours. And uh, I, I say it, it's a learning process. We're taking one step at a time until we get it right. And, and we will get it right. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Kate, over to you. Um, so, well, thank you for this question. It's, uh, this is very important. It's a, it's a very important relationship for our city to 
um, you know, we've we live in in the in this in this area that uh, that really was that belongs to others, and and we've had uh, the opportunity to to be here and to exist here. And really, on that note, I would start by saying I think one of the most important things that uh, that we can do as a city is is at the beginning of every council meeting we should be acknowledging that we're on the traditional lands of the Lusque uh, people. So I would start there, and then I would say that. You know, we much needs to be done in the, in the way of um, of continuing to build on that relationship, continuing to to understand and learn more. Um, it's a relationship that needs to be fostered more on a on a personal on an interpersonal level. We do a lot as far as uh, transactional now, more so with with St. Mary's in particular, this community that we have within our city. And I find that um, that that a lot of focus has been in the transaction. It's it's just. And through through various reasons, I think we are now focusing more on on getting, you know, developing a relationship. And I think that is really where where we need to start to 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 foster the respect and um, that one needs to have when when working with others, a, a respect, a deep understanding, um, understanding the past um, to sort of inform our to inform our future and to inform um, um, how we behave today. So when I look at some of the some of the tensions that exist, um, I sometimes just wonder if it's because we've we've over over formalized or over complicated and if if instead we just we we worked together and we worked um, as partners uh, of moving forward the kind of respect that could be generated. So to me, that would be my first, uh, I would think, honor and acknowledge right off the bat at the beginning of every one of our governance meetings and um, as, as, a, as a nod of respect and then Thank constantly you, make improvements. Can we just, can we move on to Corinne to answer that question? Yeah, um, first I wouldn't do the, as much tokenism. Uh, this really frustrates me because I've watched this um, relationship with the city. So I wouldn't tear up their heritage. I wouldn't dump their artifacts into the landfill. I'd give them back Officer Square. I wouldn't make deals about the NBX grounds and have um, designs um, paid for after there had already been meetings with them. And then send them a letter asking them, for consultation. I wouldn't offer them $30,000 towards building relationships. I'm really tired of tokening um, any particular community. I would hope there's no reason for them to respect us if they don't trust us and they have absolutely zero reason to trust anybody in the city, not just city hall, but to trust us, period. I have really good friends um, as probably everybody has with St. Mary's and Indigenous people and Indigenous students. And the one thing that is common is there's no reason to trust us until we give them back. And I mean, we have taken, we say that we sit on their land. Yeah, we sit on their land, but we keep taking it and we don't let them have what they do. You don't take away washrooms. You don't take away, you, you don't plow over an area that is considered sacred to them. And this is this really, this is the one question where you can see my whole demeanor change, I think, because I've spoken with so many and it is completely frustrating. So building community is trying to build trust before anything and inviting them to have a seat at the table or going to them when they invite us. Thank you, Corinne. All right, everyone has had a chance to answer that question now, I believe. So we're gonna go on to the next one. I already read the preamble for that, so I'll just repeat the question. With that level of interest in the work of our organization and others, can you tell me why poor people should even bother voting in this election? Why not just send out the ballots to the developers and let the rest of us go home? Mike, it's yours. Yeah, thank you. Look, uh, it's uh, I can I can hear the frustration in the question, and um, and and I understand that. There's um, I was had the honor of uh, 
uh, starting the, uh, the the city of Frederick Green's affordable housing committee probably about 10 or 12 years ago and um, trying to find ways to get more affordable housing built in the city and uh, social housing that people get the affordable mixed up with social housing and uh, de getting developers to do it so they could take advantage of the programs to provide more housing for people um, that were in need. And then I was asked to chair the community action group on homelessness for two years while we developed the road home, which was a plan to try to end chronic homelessness in the city of Fredericton. Um, and in that we, we really for the first time that in, to my knowledge, we engaged people with lived experience. Um, uh, current people that are homeless and people from the shelter or the people currently at the shelter and also people that had, had the experience so they could guide us in that project. And we come up with a very comprehensive uh, multi-year plan. Uh, unfortunately, it did require a substantial investment from the province, which we never received, but there's a lot of good things came out of it. Um, a lot of the engagement now between different groups that never talked before, uh, people that are not discharged from the hospital like they were before onto the street without somebody being there to, uh, to catch them and guide them. So it was a lot of interaction between the, the different groups. The faith communities came together to really coordinate. So uh, it, it, it's a challenge because people that are living in, in poverty don't have a voice. Um, and uh, collectively, we have to find a way to improve that. The Frederick Daly Poverty does a great job. And I know they're frustrated because there's never enough money and there's always a demand. And it seems like you're never going, uh, getting the cooperation you do. But in the background, people are doing their, their best uh, to do what we can. Um, all I can say is that every, every year we get more aware and as we get more aware, we, we can improve. So it's, uh, you know, my time at the Community Action Group and Homelessness really drove that home. And, um, and uh, so thanks for the question and, and thanks for the challenge. Thank you, Mike. All right, uh, Kate, you're next. Thank you, and thank you for this question um, from FAPO. I, um, I was uh, the writer on the province's uh, second poverty reduction plan. And when we, we, it was called Overcoming Poverty Together too. And when we wrote that plan, uh, there was a lot of engagement. It was informed by voices from throughout the province. We traveled the province and, and engaged with, with everyone and tried very hard to have people at the table with, with lived experience who, who could share what they were experiencing. And then we tried to reflect that within the plan. And I would say also since then working at the Fredericton Community Foundation and working directly with groups um, who, who provide programming and deliver services to, to folks who are uh, uh, experiencing poverty and who are socioeconomically challenged, I get to see these things firsthand. And I would say what I, what I see most, um, that it's most prevalent is you have this sense these people don't feel that they don't have a voice and it's because as as leaders we have not we have not listened when they speak we maybe hear them we include them we uh, include those folks and we sit around the table but then when we make decisions we don't we don't reflect what it is that they're actually telling us we find reasons why it is that we can't provide what they need, whether that be jurisdictional reasons, whether that be it's not the way that we do things, that they don't fit within our, within our tiny little programs. And I think that it's incumbent on us to maybe to adapt our the way that the way that we do things so that we are able to be inclusive and, and create a sense of belonging and, and, and a voice um, for those folks who are experiencing poverty. So that would be, that is always frankly, much of my career has been in pursuit of creating a, a sense of belonging within our community. And I think that what we are seeing increasingly is those who, who require that most are often those who are disenfranchised due to poverty. So I would, uh, it, uh, and I think a vote is what's critical. That's the first way that, that you can have, uh, that you Thank can you exercise Kate. that. Thank you, Kate. That, that's great. Corinne? It is a really good question, and it's one that I hear from students all the time. Um, you know, why don't we don't have a place that we can afford? Seniors who have to sell their homes don't have a place where they can afford to move into. And so maybe the first step is to just look to see who the developers always are. Um, there has to be more people who can put up housing than the, the few developers in the city who keep getting used over and over. Um, start building communities instead of just pop-up housing that is middle to higher income. 
and start building communities. Uh, we're talking about building on the NBX grounds. That should be intergenerational. It should be different socioeconomic statuses. It should include this community type of uh, building structure where it suits the needs of everybody. I understand that when, um, you know, again, it's pushed off as well. This is a provincial problem, um, but it's people, we're gonna have more people on the street and we are creating our own housing crisis as long as we just keep putting up pop-up buildings here, there and everywhere. And um, there's not a real, I, I, I know there's the Imagine Fredericton plan. So there's a, there's a plan, but what we see is buildings going up everywhere. And when I watch, um, the city council meetings and variances are given for to create a building that's three feet from the next building and it can go up another extra story high and um, they're in places where they shouldn't be and they're not following heritage and um, you know it just doesn't make any sense uh, so yeah there has to be better work with the provincial government to um, make sure that we have rent income uh, rent control and that the developers don't just have their way in putting up whatever they want. Thank you, Corinne. Uh, Drew, it's your turn. Thank you. Uh, the first thing I wanted to say is um, whoever that individual was who submitted that question, don't give up hope. It's very hard when you're down and you're struggling, but hope and hope is elusive when you're in that situation. Um, on my nomination papers, I had a number of gentlemen who were in housing insecure situations and they were good enough to sign my papers. And of course, when I went to have them certified, the returning officer said, well, they no longer reside at that residence. So I hear you and I won't forget you and I will do everything in my power to help you get somewhere better. Um, I was talking straight out action. Right now I reside in a well it's sort of a glorified single resident occupancy it used to be the old keddies this facility was sold for 4.5 million dollars to my present landlords and if you wanted to put a price tag on putting up say oh i don't know 200 people in a reasonable secure building with adequate facilities and space to help set up support programs um there you have it the city could find uh money to buy this facility it certainly would parallel or be perhaps better than the city motel so there is a solution um i wish i wish our president incumbent mayor and our councillor would offer solutions uh committee and council is great but what has it done for us? Thank you, Drew. All right, the next round of questions will be started with Kate. And uh, here is the question. Are you committed to being a mayor who prioritizes making LGBTQIA plus folks feel safer and welcome in Fredericton and what does this look like? So we're starting this time with Kate. Yes, well, first of all, to a, a quick answer to that question, yes. And I, I think, you know, I ran my, the first time I ran in council in 2012, it was, uh, I ran on the on the slogan, a city that works for everyone. And to me, we're only as successful as a city if we're working for everyone. And we've certainly, been hearing, especially recently, how we haven't been working for everyone. Not everyone feels as though they're included. And while we may not be intentionally excluding, if we're not intentionally including, then I feel that we're not doing our job as leaders and, and as, as fellow residents. So I am... Um, you know, we recently, it's interesting, my, at my most recent job, the Fredericton Community Foundation, we actually um, had, a, had a really wonderful, uh, vital conversation is what they're called with, um, with young people uh, with, with that population, the LGBTQ plus was, um, uh, and, and I learned so much then. And mostly what I learned is, is how sometimes what 
perceived as safe spaces aren't always safe spaces because they're not they're not provided in the spirit um, that, that we again provide these safe spaces in a way that we know to be safe as opposed to being embracive and asking other asking those who are living that reality to help us to shape what is a safe space and what does that look like so again a lot of it is active listening and knowing what it is um, that's that's needed um, hearing listening to to folks who are experiencing this their their lived reality who are living their lives and and sharing with us what that is like and what it is that they need from their city um, to make them feel a real sense of belonging. So I, uh, I think it's critical. I have, I have, per, I have um, personal family experience with this, and I see the difference that experience can be when there is a true sense of of welcoming and belonging and love, just love. Thank you, Kate. Corinne. Yeah, um, I would say that listen to them, as Kate said. Certainly one of the things that I have found when I'm teaching is um, I don't know the experiences. And even when I'm using textbooks or teaching gender, I'll often have a student come and say, can I teach this one? Because that is so wrong. Like that was clearly written by cisgender. And so, um, you know, I need, to, I need to straighten this out. So just as inviting indigenous groups to the table and uh, multicultural, groups to the table, then we need to also understand their experience because I don't know what a safe place looks like. And I don't think to this point that I can, can speak for a group of people that they come into, you know, students who come into my office and say, we've been harassed. And um, certainly I do think there's a place here for um, there to be engagement for bullying, um, uh, that type of harassment. And so perhaps their police do have to get involved when there's violence in, involved in those situations. But I, I you know, it, it's all I can say is I do believe that there has to be safe places, but I don't know what they look like. And so we have to invite them to the table and we have to work with the schools and the experts in that field um, certainly our post-secondary education and our high schools who can help us figure it out. Thank you, Corinne. Drew, over to you. Sorry, I was a little slow on the unmute. Um, this, is a, a, this is really interesting because I, I happened to read an article written in the Aquinian by a person who was undergoing a transition. And uh, the article really touched me because this person was struggling with being accepted, feeling safe, a lot of things that uh, a lot of people take for granted. And um, unfortunately in our city, we don't have spaces, certainly the social spaces. We had the boom nightclub, but of course that's available to a certain segment of the population, but at least it provided a social gathering where they could be in a safe place. Um, and of course, then we've had our clinic close on Brunswick, which was um, also, if I understand correctly, was also helping with counseling. So as, as I'm not sure what, we can certainly listen. Corrine has it right. We can listen, we can sit down, we can invite them to the table, get their feedback, what we can do differently to make this place feel better for them. I, I remember when, uh, what a big deal it was for the city to have the rainbow crosswalk. And uh, unfortunately, I remember a former mayor who was not uh, keen on recognizing um, the special day for that community. Uh, and that's unfortunate because um, people are people. They want to be respected. They want to be acknowledged as, as being a, member of our community and valuable to our community and this group is just like so many other groups thank you drew mike over to you yeah thank you uh, i i will I'll, i'm going to repeat too is uh what corinne said i mean um uh, i have to learn more uh, one of the 
greatest privileges of being mayor is uh, pre-COVID at least, was the 70 hours a week I put into the job. And a lot of that is being invited to, uh, to events and functions uh, where you can talk and listen to people. And I've uh, had the honor of uh, at least being, uh, all the different uh, high school groups that deal with LGBTQ plus, um, uh, the, the wonderful students that are, uh, you know, speaking up for their rights and their and expressing the fears have invited me in. Um, and every time I go, I learn something, and I'm just shocked at how little I knew. Um, so uh, I will not uh, try to say that I have any answers other than continue to listen. We do have to make this a completely safe city for everybody, a welcoming city for everybody. And every time I go, I learn more. And hopefully, the more I learn, I can apply those learnings to into actions. Uh, that's been a word tonight. A lot of people said actions, um, but you know, uh, one of the greatest teachers I have is my uh, my granddaughter, who's in grade nine at Fredericton High School. When her friends come here to visit, and they educate me on things that I just didn't understand. Um, uh, so, to Corinne's point, it's about listening and learning, and uh, trying to take those learnings and apply them to uh, into real actions that make people that would feel marginalized or not safe feel completely safe and comfortable uh, in their city. So that's my commitment. Listen, Thank you. try to learn. Thank you, Mike. Okay. La septième question, commençant avec Corinne. As a result of ad hoc piecemeal decisions, key components of Fredericton's built heritage have been destroyed over the past few years, highlighting the need for a comprehensive heritage plan for the city. Such a plan providing consistency and effective public consultation is needed to protect irreplaceable heritage that is recognized as locally, regionally, and nationally significant. If elected, what will you do to implement a comprehensive heritage plan for Fredericton? Corinne, over to you. I think as um, Kate said in an earlier um, response, we have the expertise in the city um, to recognize what our heritage buildings are, what our heritage spaces are. Um, one of the first reasons I decided to run for mayor was because I saw the dismantling of the city, a systematic dismantling. And um, I just couldn't uh, let it go. It just kept bothering me. And so I do believe that if a building or a site is already designated, then we don't touch it, except to um, restore it, to preserve it, and to allow the people who value that space to be engaged in its preservation. So Mary's Wolf is a very good instance. Our burial grounds is another good instance. Um, some of the buildings that have been taken down is, is devastating to me. And we do need to have a committee and the bylaws cannot be changed if it is designated as a heritage space. We can't say, well, you know, um, we're just going to put up this building anyway. Well, it, it has to be, I mean, it's as simple as that. You just can't go roughshod. And there are so many cities that are doing it well. You know, look at the cities around us, even across Canada, we don't have to go across any place else. There are cities that do all kinds of wonderful things, um, especially with foundations, helping to supplement the income that would be needed. And so, yeah, you just have to go with the National Heritage Site and what is designated provincial. And if the province sells it to you for a buck, then you make a, a, a claim that you're going to preserve it. It's just but it has to be, it has to be an absolute dedication. Thank you, Corinne. Drew, you're up next. Heritage and the heritage buildings in Fredericton are what really make us, give us our character. So, and I have a background in classical studies, so I always like a lot of architecture that's interesting um, as a, an aside, I've always thought the Centennial Building is probably one of the ugliest representations of architecture I've ever seen. Plopped down in a beautiful neighborhood of some very fine homes. Uh, 
And Corrine is, is right. Uh, there have been a lot of changes in the demolitions of things that we've tolerated because we say, well, they're old. Uh, we need the new, we need this or we need that. Um, having lived in Marysville, I remember one of the first things I was told was, yes, we had our wonderful store and they destroyed it for, uh, so the tractor trailers wouldn't have to take a wide swing when they were turning right. So that's a problem. If, if you can't identify and protect what's really meaningful, then what are we doing as a city? Um, so right now, I, I mean, I look at the south side, there's still a huge amount of opportunity there to work with what we have. The downtown core, I have to agree with some of these developments that are springing up sort of down on King Street. Uh, of course, the big one on Queen. Um, there's going to be a lot of pressure on that little downtown core. And we've got to stand firm and say, okay, we need these things to stay. They, they matter. They give us our character and our history. Without them, we're just, uh, we're just another uh, high rise. Thank you, Drew. Mike, over to you. Thank you. Um, the uh, staff and council uh, are, are currently bringing forward, or working very hard to bring forward a new heritage bylaw to try to tighten up some of the loose parts that uh, have been identified. And the public has uh, been speaking about this as well. So uh, we, we've heard, we, we've listened, and we're going to bring that forward. There'll be a, a lot of discussion on that. And uh, hopefully we can bring something forward that the citizens will have comfort and faith in and uh, we'll set a new standard going forward because it is important. Um, without, uh, with some of the looseness of kind of the current bylaw, it allows things to slip through the cracks. And uh, so we're gonna tighten those up. I would love to have more heritage neighborhoods as well. Um, I remember the, the, the real tough discussions around the Queen Square neighborhood. Uh, I've, I've got the wrong word for it, that's not it, but the heritage neighborhood. Um, and uh, the pushback that uh, when but finally we had to we had to do a, a quilt work a patchwork there to get a bylaw in so that we could protect those that beautiful neighborhood. But it finally came together. I went with staff to the St. Mary's area, the St. Mary's Ferry area, to uh, engage that community probably 15 years ago about adopting a heritage bylaw to protect that neighborhood, and we were ro ro robustly dismissed. Uh, people did not want that. Um, and, and what's happened after that, of course, it allowed some developments to happen that wouldn't have happened if it had the heritage protection. So uh, there are other areas in the city that we, 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 we do have to educate. We get the bylaw tightened up uh, that it gives people comfort and, and sets a, a straight path going forward. And also we have to educate the, the, the rest of the community about the need for some of the heritage protection. It's uh, not just for the immediate future, uh, it's, for the, it's for the future. And uh, yes, it brings restrictions into a neighborhood, but it also brings protection. So uh, I think it's been very well uh, done in the, uh, in the, uh, the Queen Square uh, University Avenue area. And uh, the new bylaw will tighten that up. Thank you. Running thank you, time. Mike. Kate? Yes, thank you. Um, look, I, we have not been robust enough in our protection and, and celebration of heritage. Uh, when we speak of the neighborhoods, I actually, within my ward is the preservation, the uh, review, the heritage preservation area and the area over it by Queen Square, uh, it was before I went on council, but it was actually not successful in becoming a heritage uh, preservation area. So we just kind of have this one, this one pocket that does go over into certain streets over there, but, but not in, in, not all of it. And it's because I think that people instead see the limitations of being in a heritage designated area, as opposed to all of the many benefits. Um, in my, I've been releasing policy platform uh, spotlights and in, in thoughtful development, I speak to the, this need that we have that we need to be increasing. Um, we need to tighten up the heritage bylaw, but also what we need to include there are building guidelines um, and design guidelines because they don't currently exist. And I think that that would also be helpful because something else that we're seeing is, um, is a lot of... Uh, of, of modern additions on heritage buildings and some people like it and some people don't and it creates confusion for those who are doing the work. So we need to tighten that up um, as well. But I am, um, you know, we've lost some of our heritage buildings and council has allowed for the demolition of some of those heritage buildings, which I always vote against because I, 
Um, we're being told that it's because it's too expensive to renovate and to, to restore a heritage building and instead we just need to start from, from scratch and demolish. When in fact, I point over to the Pickeroons Roundhouse all the time and give an example of a heritage building that was lovingly restored and brought into a modern context by a local business person. And no one can tell me that that isn't, it isn't an economically viable option. I think that if we do a good job at restoring and preserving our heritage, it actually increases property values. But what it does most, it allows us to keep our story of Fredericton. These buildings tell the story of our character. Thank you, Kate. Okay, I would just like to remind the participants at this point, once again, to make sure you have voted for uh, the question that or questions that you find most important on your Q&A list. If you click that icon, you'll see all the questions there and just put a thumbs up where you think it's important to address it. The next round will be starting with Drew Brown. And la huitième question commence avec Drew. Over the past year, the city of Fredericton has asked public transportation services having service routes, leaving many workers without access to public transportation. This not only hinders choice of employment, location for renting or purchasing housing, as well as access to services such as healthcare, but it also limits our ability to limit greenhouse gas emissions. A robust public transportation network that meets the needs of riders is well-funded and an essential component in addressing the climate crisis. The question, what steps would you take to improve and actively promote our public transportation system in Fredericton, Drew? Well, thank you for the question. I am, up until February of 2021, was a monthly bus pass holder for the Fredericton Transit. I used to ride on the 16, Route, 6, Route 16, 17 coming out of Marysville. Uh, it is vital uh, for the working class, uh, senior citizens. Um, we now have, this is one thing that uh, Kate and Mike have lots to be proud of is that the city over 10 years finally now has a wheelchair accessible and walker accessible uh, buses. So this is really exciting. Um, of course, that still means we have to build areas where they can actually get on the bus in the winter and the places have to be maintained, but it's a huge accomplishment. I guess I, I, I think what can be done with the bus service is we have to make employers aware of when our buses are running. And uh, if you're going to schedule someone for six o'clock in the morning, well, the buses aren't running then. And if you're going to schedule them for 11 o'clock at night, the buses are not running then. So if you're not going to be helping out your employees by trying to make the schedule, scheduling of their work time efficient, uh, you're causing a great deal of hardship for your employees and for the people who um, are, are doing their best, perhaps living on minimum wage. And... Uh, so these things, we want to make sure our transit system, as some may be aware, we still haven't had restoration of, of the um, rush hour service. And I know that's a hardship for a lot of working people. And what the rush hour service is, is basically we had buses running on the half hour from 6 to 8, and then from 4.30 to 6, if I remember correctly. So that's something we have to look at restoring once our ridership recovers. I would be interesting to find out what our ridership levels are at now to see if that can be done. Thank you, Drew. Mike, over to you. Look, um, transit is an absolutely essential service. And, and it's one of the reasons I did run for council uh, a long time ago. I was a uh, continual transit op uh, user until they eliminated my bus route after five years and I couldn't could no longer get to my place of work with it. But, uh, but when you get on council, you learn some of the intricacies of it. It's an extremely expensive, it, it not it's essential, but it's extremely expensive to operate, and it works on density. So we we the more improvements we want to make, uh, the more times we have to get some density along some of the main routes to fund more improvements. Uh, but the improvements are necessary. Uh, we need to get uh, one of the uh, things we're going to be trialing here very soon is on-demand busing. A lot of cities have gone that way. Some of them gone in entirely with great success. But we're going to trial that, and I'm I'm sure it'll work here too. And that'll let us to do. Uh, 
you know, do the on-demand type of service and, and get off of the fixed route and, and, and tailor a bus system to the people that actually need it. And if it's successful in a certain zone, I'm sure we can expand it. Uh, we have to get the Sunday service. It may not be the, uh, the full service that we provide the rest of the week, and even Saturday's a bit down, but we have to get there. But that is a multi-million dollar expense as well. So um, the excuse is that it's very expensive. The, the challenge is how do we do it while it's still expensive? So uh, we've got to get the uh, Sunday service in uh, sooner than later, you know, in the foreseeable future. We've got to trial this on-demand service so that we can really find, think out of the box and how we can uh, change our, our bus system. Um, you know, we've made some good improvements over the years. We've, uh, today we had a presentation on, uh, you know, lining up the bus shelters with the, with the, the routes better so that it makes it more accessible and, and safe. So there's a lot of work to do. Um, but, you know, we have made some good strides in the past couple of years. The U passes with the universities have really injected ridership and, and revenue to make more improvements. So um, it's a continual challenge, but absolutely essential. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Kate, over to you. Thank you. So transit's a, transit is a tricky one because a lot of it's, it feels like it's, it's chicken egg and do we, we, I think we won't get more ridership until, until we improve the service and it, it is because of the expense, it is, it's difficult to be improving the service without getting the more ridership. So I think at one point we just have to make a decision as a community how important public transit is to us and, and make, the, make the necessary investment as required. Uh, we have been, because we have certainly been making a little moves here and there, it's uh, Drew, thanks for the point out on the, um, on, on the, the shout out on the accessible buses. And, and today we did talk with some of the new uh, bus uh, bus shelters them being accessible but and and it feels like we're playing around the surfaces and I think perhaps we do need to take some more bold action when I look at it I, I see sort of three challenges one we definitely do need to get back to pre-pandemic service as people are getting back to work um, and and we need to secondly we need to figure out how we can do the scheduling better our bus schedule is very much based on sort of a, a traditional work week with Saturday errand running we need to shift that to better reflect the working reality of today so I think that looking at, at, at the timing of that service and definitely including a Sunday service is something that that we need to do to me, something critical for including uh, increasing bus ridership is getting the north side depot. We make it too complicated for folks on the north side um, to travel on the north side. This the connecting at King's Place makes it difficult uh, to move around on the bus in the north side. So there are things, uh, some bold moves that we need to make to be increasing that ridership to then make it a more viable option for everyone to use. And I think it will be. I, I want to make it better for people with cars to use it and to see it as just part of sort of an interactive transportation system that they use maybe they walk to the walk to uh, walk to get get the bus take the bus so far and then walk to their final destination or take their bike and put it on the front of the bus and you know there are lots of ways um, that, that the bus can be used once once we in, improve the service thank you Kate Corinne over to you Hi. Yeah, I think that um, certainly most cities don't see a high revenue come back from their bus service. So in fact, many know that having buses is going to mean that that is not where you make your money. Uh, I see it again as looking at where the money is spent that the city already has in their pocket, what, they're what they know they're going to have and to be able to redistribute that amongst the services that don't make them a lot of money. So you put, the, you put the stop back in front of Stepping Stones and MCAF so that seniors don't have to walk a block and the women who are pushing carriages through the winter don't have to walk a block to MCAF. Um, you make your stops where they are needed, but also um, as the rest have said, you do have to make sure that when the buses, when you can fill the buses the most, that's when they get to be used, that you have that half hour shift. And yes, on the north side, if we can create, um, and part of a long-term strategy, not an immediate strategy, but a long-term strategy is to make sure that communities have their own economic centers. And so you would be able to move around the north side, or you'd be able to move around the south side, and then you'd be able to move across the river but that it doesn't make it so completely impossible to get from the north to the north or the north to the south and then have to take a transfer somewhere. 
again, students are my teachers and they say, you know, like they come to class 15 minutes late or 40 minutes early because they can only catch the bus, you know, on every hour or they can't come on, on Sundays and they can't take buses on, you know, holidays. So definitely it needs a shift. Um, Long-term, I would see something, uh, you know, I, I see other plans, but for the immediate, I say you have to bite the bullet, just bite the bullet and provide what's needed. Thank you, Corinne. The next question from Black Lives Matter, a neuvième question, and we will start with Michael Bryan this time. Over the past year, there have been calls to reduce police force budgets and investing in community services and supports to help our most vulnerable community members. Research shows that investing in community services and support are far more effective as crime prevention than policing and criminalization. With this in mind, here's the question. Do you support calls to reduce police budgets and reallocate resources to fund community projects and supports as an effective form of public safety for all residents? Thank you for that question. Um, that's been an education process for us too at the, at the council in the last little while with the uh, Black Lives Matters presentations and, uh, and uh, discussions. Uh, so we're learning that process as well. Um, we're very, uh, very pleased that the representatives from the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, Fredericton movement are meeting with our police force on a, on a frequent basis to discuss transparency and, and interaction. So uh, that, that dialogue is ongoing. So that, that's going to reap benefits within our own police force. Uh, what people do have to understand sometimes within New Brunswick, uh, the, the, the Police Act dictates things that we do have to do. So we don't have the flexibility at, at our municipality that some may see in some of the large cities or what you may see in the cities in the United States. We just don't have that ability to do things uh, like you, you, you might see a mayor or a council do. Um, however, uh, what people don't understand and we don't communicate it well enough, our police force now has four social workers uh, on their force. So we have taken the police budget and allocated some of that money to, uh, instead of police in cars and on the beat, into social workers to work with our police force. They engage with groups within the community. They work the files when, when, when there's continual interaction with uh, people that are uh, uh, marginalized, if for, for lack of a better word, our case workers work with the uh, community groups and the police to work those files. Uh, our police also now, the, with the hub model, They've, uh, they have uh, body cameras when they're going to, especially a mental health call, um, they can now engage right with a mental health professional in their office to guide them through their, their uh, interactions with that client. So uh, in, in, we, we have taken some of the funds, put it into, uh, into that kind of service. So we're getting there. And uh, as we learn more, we'll be able to discuss uh, more changes down the road. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Kate, it's your turn. Thank you. Look, um, after all that's happened, uh, both here in New Brunswick and across North America, I can I can certainly understand the, the call for rethinking the way that uh, that police funding is allocated. And um, and I'm, you know, I'm very I'm glad that the, our police have um, have allocated funds uh, for more social workers and for for mental health professionals to work alongside our police officers for things like wellness checks. And, and as well for, for more training for police force, um, for members of the police force. I would say our, our past uh, police chief, our current police chief uh, is, uh, you know, very, very aware of the situation and, and has considered different ways of addressing it. And, uh, and I feel that this, um, the infusion of, of social workers on the force has made a difference and will continue to do so. You know, as a city, just in general, I think we need to get better um, at understanding the experiences that people are facing, particularly those from Indigenous, uh, Black, and, and other racialized communities, as well as people with mental health challenges, um, and that, that we take concrete actions to ensure that all residents, um, that all residents feel safe. And again, I think we need, we need to be very intentional in that. So often it's, it's after things have happened that that we react and and I, I you know we're we're smart enough that we can look ahead and 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 try to imagine how others what their their lived experience and listen and be open to that lived experience 
because we can only make through things better through working um, through working with the community to to identify the issues and then to work with our police force to, to make the kind of lasting change that, that improves lives for everyone. So um, I'm glad these things have been brought to our attention and gives us an opportunity to, to make improvements. Thank you, Kate. Corinne? Hmm, I hope I get this one right. My brother was a policeman with the force. So, you know, I have to, to think about this. I have thought about it a lot because um, when I teach deviance classes, of course, we talk about um, policing and alternatives to justice uh, or alternatives to violence, restorative justice. And it's easy to first say that, yes, we should defund the police, but we have to think about the roles that police say that the policemen do, police officers. So when I was walk, when I walk the trails an awful lot, I see police officers at different homes and I and I know, you know, that there's stress or something happening that doesn't happen in my home. And so it's understanding that the jobs that they again, the jobs they do are ones that I wouldn't do. I it's it's not a job that I would want or that I could do. So I think it takes a special skill and a special type of person. Now that doesn't mean, of course, that you know there aren't some off the rails, just as in every profession. But I do believe that we need upstream programs. And in talking with the, the people who work with our homeless people, um, people who have housing challenges, people who are addicted, um, and so many in the community that the that are police agencies have to work with, then we just we need those upstream programs to help kind of divert what's going to have to happen. And as Kate just used the word reactive, we have to kind of know what's coming our way. And we can prevent some of that if we're just smarter and we let the agencies that know how to do their work do their work, but support the police being in the communities um, working with young people, working in schools, being seen as friends rather than the police that's going to put them in jail. Thank you, Corinne. Drew? This is a, a very interesting issue because I feel that it's great that we have four social workers on the police force. The police force budget is $20 million a year. So I understand why people look at that and say, well, it's $20 million a year, but sometimes I feel that I'm not being treated very well by our police force. And and one thing, I've had interactions with the police officers, um, and I remember it was a particularly unpleasant experience because it happened at night. And what happened was I was pulled over. Uh, I was questioned whether I was sober. I was 100% sober, but that didn't stop the process i still wound up being brought downtown forced to do a breathalyzer all these things and uh, my feeling after that experience was how is it that i am a good citizen by day and then suddenly at nighttime i'm treated in a fashion which was like i wasn't a good citizen like i was somehow uh, at fault for being out past a certain time so i i feel that if we were going to look at training of police officers, I think they have to be aware that, you know, you can't look at a person and say, well, this person is this way or this way. I don't believe in racial profiling. I believe in engaging and talking and listening. If the officer that night had listened to me and actually listened to me and had her proper equipment, which she didn't, uh, you know, it would have avoided wasting a lot of officer's time and mine as well. So I, I, I think we have to look at our training. We have these, these four social workers, that's excellent. We've got to get it so, as Corrine said, that these police officers are not seen as, as an alien force or an occupying force, they're our neighbors and they're concerned about us and our neighborhoods, our children, and, and they're doing their best to try and make us a better city, a safer city. Thank you, Drew. Okay, uh, on to the next round. And um, it's the last of the group questions and then we'll go to participant questions according to what has risen to the top of the list. Uh, starting with Kate this time, what do you think the role of faith groups is in the prospering 
and well-being of our city. So, um, well, most recently, I think I'll share maybe my most recent um, experience. Um, so having grown up in a, in a faith uh in a faith congregation here. I'm, I'm Anglican, so I'm glad that the Anglican Diocese, I think, is one of the groups that's organized this. Thank you. And grew up in the Anglican Church. And um, and I will say my church is one of the churches, along with many other in the faith community, who have um, purchased Housing First, uh, have, have uh, dedicated funds to the Housing First Fund, which uh, goes towards some of the Housing First builds. Um, and we, I think repeatedly, we see our faith community step forward and, and provide that very vital social role. We see it, uh, so many have drop-ins, have um, just drop-ins coffee hours. They, they have places where they have uh, clothing that's made available. They have, do supper hours. I know Wilmot, I think, does this, uh, it typically would do a Saturday night supper. So I think that they fill the gap sort of between where we're seeing a if there's a letdown in social services and then in areas where the nonprofit sector can't always pick up, uh, pick up the, the slack, then the, the community, the, sorry, the faith, con the faith congregations are there um, to, to help. And, and I think, you know, they do it, their, their values compel them to do it and, and their values and their beliefs compel them to do it and to show, um, to show grace to others in the community. And I, I know that I'm very thankful that, that they have provided this. So they, they reach beyond their own congregation. And I find that very interesting too, particularly I go to, I go to a church, it's very old and very expensive to operate, but, but the congregation chooses to use some of its funds, not for themselves and not for just for just their congregation in their building, but rather to do community outreach. And I think that they're motivated to do that, like I say, through their values and beliefs. And our city is, is richer for it and the community is rich, enriched by it. Thank you, Kate. Corinne. Yeah, I think faith-based and spiritual groups are very important in any, um, any community. Uh, it is important that we learn more from each other's groups. Uh, you know, we tend to stick to our own and maybe not recognize the importance of all of the different faith-based groups. I think that it would be important to have them recognized and work in City Hall, and they, they don't. I mean, it's been, you know, no prayer in City Hall, no prayer in schools, no prayer anywhere. And it doesn't just mean that we can't have um, prayer from you know, Catholics, Anglicans, Protestants sort of thing. It's that we we allow every faith-based group. So it's not that we have to, um, and I know I'm gonna get, okay, you just lost my vote. I already saw that on my Facebook stream. No, you just lost my vote. So, but this is my, this is what I see. I, I agree with Kate in that they bring huge, um, just huge resources, if you want to even just call it resources, into our communities. I've gone out with with um, Brian and Pastor Steve at night to the tents, and um, they do a work that no other organization does. And so we need them. We need them in the communities, and we need to know all of our faith-based groups and what the different spiritualities look like. Thank you, Corinne. Drew, your turn. Well, I have a very specific example, and this is a great shout out, I believe, for Christ Church. Um, I have a neighbor here, he's a senior citizen fellow, and he had just moved here, and he has no phone, he has no way of really contacting or setting up services, and uh, he expressed a great deal of frustration because he had tried to set up some services for himself, and he hadn't been successful, and uh, Christ Church has... They sent a, a, a wonderful lady to come visit with him, talk to him, see what he needed. He got on the, she got on her phone to talk to Rogers, to of course the wonderful internet provider and all that stuff, but she stuck with it. She stuck with him for over an hour, just getting that issue resolved and then checking in to see, well, we could help you maybe with a, a little phone so you have some way of communicating and uh it was just so wonderful to see his demeanor change he was so much happier uh and i've been talking to him the last couple of days and he is just uh really really thankful that this help is you know this help and hope i mean the churches provide that help and hope they're vital especially when you're struggling i mean 
that that is something Fredericton has all mass. We have plenty of it. And I'm so thankful and glad that we are blessed with such a strong Christian community. Thank you, Drew. Mike, it's your turn. Thank you. Um, I think the, the faith-based groups have a, a significant role to play and, uh, and they do, and especially the ones in an in urban course, you know, serving the clientele uh, on, uh, that are in that, that area. Um, one of the first actions I took when I became mayor was to call the mayor's task force on homelessness to try to find a way that the city could engage more on those files and support the community action group on homelessness. And I wrote a letter on behalf of the committee uh, to the different faith-based groups within the Fredericton region. And if I remember correctly, there was about 70 some entities, you know, uh, that are in the faith-based community. And about 50 gathered on the day. We, we had a, a great gathering with about 45 to 50 different uh, faith-based groups. And we're trying to connect on how everything that they do to support homelessness and the marginalized. And it was amazing, the services that are being provided from putting people in hotels for a weekend to providing clothes, to transportation, to food, to whatever. And out of that, they, they, uh, they came together even more closely. So I was very proud of that day. And out of that came the thing called the caring calendar that the community now can connect and, and not duplicate services and they can all interact together. So, and, and then another step was when it was already referenced that uh, two or three of the, uh, the churches in our area are, are sponsoring the, um, the, uh, the micro homes that are, uh, some are already built, some are in, in works. And, uh, and I went to present uh, along with the people to, uh, to make the pitch and so warmly received by the different groups. Uh, so um, what they do um, day to day is amazing, but what they're doing on the, the bigger files when they came together in this collective that day was a very powerful movement. And uh, they've made a significant difference. They, they have been, but going forward, I, I, I see the, the, uh, when they came together in this group, uh, the power that can come together when they were en masse uh, so I'm very, uh, very hopeful going forward that they will continue to do great work. Thank you, Mike. Okay, now we're going to head into the list of questions that are coming in from the participants, starting with the most popular question at the top of the list. There are over 76 questions here, so obviously we're not going to get there. But let's take uh, the questions that seem to be the most concerning to people. And we're going to start this round with Corinne this time. True. Let me arrange my little pieces of paper here. Okay, here's the question. The damage done to Officer Square is a public and environmental shame. If elected, will you work to restore it? And can you please plant more trees? That's Starting easy. with Corinne. That's easy for me. <laughs> yes. I would, well, first we have to look and see what contracts have already been signed and what it's going to cost the city to get out of those because I expect there have been contracts signed that we're not necessarily aware of. Um, if not, if there aren't any more contracts that we that need to be fulfilled, um, give it back to the people. It's the people square. Um, give it back. There's the expertise in Fredericton. We will plant that sucker up. We will put the benches in. My thing is, I, if there's anything I can do well, it's plant gardens. Um, you know, uh, been doing them at, uh, all over the city and in the Salvation Army and Pine Grove and um, Estonia. <laughs> so um, I can do that. But there are so many in Fredericton that would just love to get back at Officer Square and get in there and put that back the way it is. But before we do anything, we have to invite St. Mary's and the Indigenous community in there to to look at what it is that is theirs. And there also should be some museums there. Yeah, absolutely. It it's, uh, breaks my heart. Thank you, Corinne. Rue, it's on you now. Officer Square, I, I have to say, I was very disappointed as a forester and I do love trees and I know every tree that's been cut down in Fredericton because I walk by them and think of them almost every day. It's a bit of a torture really, because um, there's so many, but uh, the officer square thing, planting trees is no problem for me. I could do it all day long. I've done it for a number of years and I could still plant uh, certainly enough trees to cover officer square. Um, however, 
there's more other, as Corinne pointed out, there's other issues there as well. I think um, if we're going to try and make Officer Square more inclusive, then we have to have something that is from the uh, First Nations community, something that is of significance for them that makes that space also acknowledges their presence and makes that space more their space. So it's just not our colonial legacy, but also um, which reflects their legacy as well. Uh, yes, I, I'm, uh, I have to echo what Corrine said. I'm wondering what else we'll have to pay for uh, before we can maybe do something with that square. But if, if there isn't too much in the way of paperwork, the reforestation of it, that could be done very quickly. Uh, and then we could work on the other issues. Trees need time to grow, but uh, there's certainly lots of trees uh, in this province. Thank you, Drew. Mike, over to you. Thank you. Um, well, the, the wall is, uh, the, the wall work will be uh, finished in this spring and uh, it'll bring some, uh, some uh, semblance of order back uh, when that happens. And then the, the 35, there's 35 trees planned to be planted in that square. The ones that'll be along the wall, once the wall's completed, can be planted, uh, especially along the, uh, the Regent Street side, quite immediately and start to bring some, uh, some greenery back to that. The, the indigenous consultations that are taking place are still ongoing. And until those are completed with the province, uh, we will not know what the next steps are because that's the, uh, that is obviously uh, the, uh, uh, the very important process that uh, had to take place and is taking place. So um, when, that, when that is completed, uh, the next steps, we'll, we'll see uh, how we can uh, mitigate or accommodate or facilitate and, uh, and then and move forward. Uh, I personally, uh, when that square is finished, uh, if it's still the vision that's there or modified even slightly, will be a, 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 a welcomed addition to our community. It's going to uh, bring, it's our most beloved space, um, uh, so unfortunately, some of the views that people put online are just showing a front corner of it where there's some, uh, um, uh, where the, the, the stage space is now. Uh, the Great Lawn is going to be there. The, the Great Lawn is going to be even larger than before. So, uh, and then with 35 trees planted. So um, uh, the, the final vision may not look exactly as being proposed right now because we'll see where the consultations go. But once done, it'll be a very well uh, received. I think it'll be a, a welcome addition in our downtown in our city, bring people there in that square and celebrate like they did before, uh, we'll do it in a respectful way. So um, it's been a challenge. Uh, absolutely, I acknowledge that. I think the end product, people will be extremely proud of. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Kate? Thank you. So I'll start with the trees. I was at uh, Officer Square last evening and I can say, because there are so few there right now, the wind just whips across the square and it's actually not even pleasant really to be there and it shows the importance for these trees. And I, I'm aware that the, there are, there's um, the, the plan to, to plant the 35 trees along the wall that hopefully will help, help with some of that, help mitigate some of the, the wind that makes uh, that's uh, problematic actually throughout our downtown as we increasingly cut trees and put big high rise buildings. Look, I am, I have been right in the midst of Officer Square since the very beginning. And I, I think back to the night that we presented the plan and people were in the chambers and very upset and all of my colleagues left and I stayed and listened to the concerns. And I've been listening to those concerns really ever since. And I can tell you as I go door to door now and meet with residents, what I'm hearing most, most frequently is a concern for Officer Square. I hear two things, Officer Square and, and homelessness. And I, people just think we did too much, that we went overboard, that we've tried to do too much in that little square and that we've lost sight of, of, its, of what it really is there for. It's a historic site that celebrates part of our history. And it's not just our history, it is the history of, of everyone that was here. And I think as, as others have said, all, all the more need to, in, to ensure that we include um, indigenous voices in, in the square and in our plans for it. But look, I am, um, I think that we we overdid it and maybe we need to hit 
hit reset and, and revisit what it is that, uh, that that square is supposed to be, maybe just simplified a little. We know we want it to be the heart of our downtown, alive and vibrant and entertainment. And we want people to be able to, to perform and, 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 and enjoy, enjoy live entertainment in that space. But, but do we need all of the built infrastructure that's planned? I don't know. Do we need to put lots of concrete and cement blocks down? I don't know. I think we just need to live in that space and enjoy its natural and historic beauty. Thank you, Kate. Uh, that was obviously a very important question to a lot of people because almost half of the participants voted to make that the first question. So that gives you a bit of an anchor as to how important that question was. Uh, we've got time. If you could each agree to kind of run through this at a one minute time, that would be great because then that gives us just enough time for closing remarks and then and then we're done. So this is the next question and we are starting with Drew this time. And here's the question. To each of the candidates, Fredericton is becoming increasingly more diverse and multicultural. Name one new initiative that you would launch in order to ensure that Fredericton is a welcoming community that nurtures social cohesion and economic opportunity for all its residents. You're on, Drew. One minute. Oh, okay. One minute. Yeah. Oh, well, we are lucky that we have a multicultural association. That is a big positive for Fredericton, uh, trying to orient newcomers and uh, other groups. I mean, we also have Francophones. We have Indigenous peoples. Um, I guess the, the only thing I can really say is that we would need to see or hopefully be able to provide events or opportunities for people to come together. Um, we do have those things going on in the city now. We do have things, but maybe uh, maybe we should have a multicultural day. We certainly are very fortunate that on the St. Mary's Reserve, we have the powwow. Uh, and I, I'm going to just cut it short there because I, I want other people to have a chance to talk. Thank you, Drew. Corinne. Yeah, I think that um, first I found from working at Salvation Army Gardens that MCAF doesn't represent everybody. So it's important to bring MCAF in, but to also recognize that there are others who MCAF doesn't represent. But I think that certainly one of the things we can do is use the NBX grounds for many cultural events. So have that space open, help provide funding to it, which hasn't, uh, my understanding is that the city has not funded the NBX grounds very extensively. And um, to be able to make sure that there are events and that is open for different groups of people at all times, whether it's food fests or whether it's um, spiritual fests or whether it's something like the powwow or whatever the groups tend to do. And also housing. We need more intercultural housing and housing that supports families. Thank you, Corinne. Mike. Thank you. We do need more housing for uh, newcomers that are coming here and that's a big challenge, but um, cultural events for sure. But I think the, the one thing we can really do to send a statement is, uh, is really work with the province to get the lost votes campaign over the goal line. Um, we have thousands of people in our community that are living here, owning businesses, contributing, and um, and paying taxes, and uh, but can't vote in a municipal election, and uh, I think that makes uh, that marginalizes this uh, important group. And I think uh, working with the province to get the lost votes campaign done will uh, bring thousands more uh, into the fold and feel like they are fully contributing members of our community. So that I think that's one of the big things that we could do to really send a statement. So. Thank you, Mike. Kate. Thank you. Um, so it's funny, I'm, I've taken a little fun factor to this. I guess when I heard you ask the question, I was thinking sort of of one thing to do. And the first thing that came to mind for me was a big community picnic. And it's because I remember as a kid going to when we would have the you know, you'd have large, you could, you'd have city picnics and you could go get cake and go get fried chicken or whatever. And it was, it just seems gathering over food 
and around food. And if it's and if it's a community picnic that's near one of our community gardens where the food has been grown, all the better. But but a community picnic where people of all cultures are coming and bringing bringing their own food, and then there's live entertainment of uh, that's celebrating the cultures. And I just see it as being a real intercultural opportunity. Again, it isn't something as you know. Certainly, there are more grave um, initiatives that we need to take that are much more serious and and they're extremely important too but when I think of a real opportunity for us to come together and celebrate and get to know each other I think it needs to be in a, in a social environment and where people just come with it with an openness and a, and a, and a, a friendliness and a sharing each other's just sharing each other's cultural mores and experiences. Thank you Kate. Okay so we are that quickly approaching uh, the closing time here. So I will give each of the candidates one minute to just sum up, give a little closing remark, one minute, and then we'll wish you all a good night. So let's begin with, uh, I guess, Corinne, you're first. I think that um, the reasons that I chose to ran are specifically because I saw the city moving in a direction that didn't seem to um, coincide with the voices of the people. I still see that being pushed forward. And so I'm the different vote. Um, if people want to see something different in the city, I believe I'm the only one that can push forward on that. So that's, hope everybody gets out to vote and um, mail, vote by you know, mail, get your mail in ballot or whatever you have to do, but I hope everybody votes. Thank you very much, Corinne. Mike. Well, thanks for the opportunity tonight. It's, uh, it's been an education on a lot of files and I appreciate that. Well, I'm very proud of where the city's going. We have a lot of challenges, uh, but, uh, but together we can address those. I have the experience and the vision and the leadership to, to help move those difficult files forward. Um, I, I don't uh, think for a second that they're easy, but it hasn't been easy the last 20 years. And we've, uh, this city's been pro pro progressed a lot. I'm very proud of where we've been. It's a team, it's a team effort, um, but it's gonna take a lot of hard work here, especially the social issues that have risen up in the last little while, and we're really gonna have to address together. So uh, um, uh, love to have the opportunity to be back for, as your mayor again, and bring the passion that I bring to it, the, uh, and uh, help this great city become even greater and overcome some of the challenges that we had. Thank you. Hey, Kate, it's your turn. Thank you. I'll, I'll start where I finished off in my introductory comments. And one of the reasons I'm running, uh, one of the many is I'm watching the city is growing. We're growing by 1500 a year. We didn't really talk about that much uh, tonight, but with that growth, comes a pressure and and I I want a city whose growth is matched by its ability to house people care for people and support the businesses uh, that that help drive our economy and and I you know I think in order to be able to do that you do require experience uh, it's uh, there's a there's a lot to know when running a city but I think also to do that we need a new approach and that new approach has to come with change and I bring that change with experience and, and I look forward to, to bringing the community together and, and moving forward and further together. Thank you very much, Kate. Drew, you're last. But not least. Not least. <laughs> now, um, I'm campaigning because I believe we have to be in an active stance. I'm a mayor for action. I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to be out there pushing and like I said I'm willing to put my back into it I'm willing to do those things I believe very strongly in the city of Fredericton I think there can be done many things we can do on our own we don't have to be sitting and waiting on sitting on our hands and waiting for this collaboration and that collaboration um, we can do what we can do and that's what will drive me as mayor I will do what we can do and as i said if i if i can't can't is not going to be my vocabulary i will do what we can do thank you thank you drew 
Well, I just have to say, I cannot believe we're right on the money for the, <laughs> for the time. It's 8.58 right now, and we promised you that we'd let you go at 9 o'clock. So to all the candidates that have been on the hot seat tonight, I know it's not an easy place to be, but I think there were some dynamite questions asked here, and I think those questions represent an awful lot of people in the area. So, and, and each of you took turns and, you know, you, you respected the timing. Thank you very much for making this event possible. And I'm so glad that all four of you were here. So thanks for that. Chapeau bas à tout le monde qui a participé dans cet événement. Je vous souhaite la bonne chance au jour de scrutin. Bonne nuit. Thanks to everyone who helped to make this event successful the planners, the deliverers, everybody. A special thanks to our participants. Because of your engagement, more informed choices will be made on election day. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here. And shout out Thank to Jean-Louis. And a Thank shout you. out to Jean-Louis. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Good night. Thank Good you. Night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.